Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Welcome to the worship of God at Fairview United Church of Christ. Welcome to all of you who are worshiping with us at home. It is a joy to be with you on this Lord's Day. It might be the warmest day we're going to have until next year. Who knows? It's one thing I've learned this year, don't try to predict anything. So... Uh, through Thanksgiving, we will collect food and funds for the Sabetha and the Hiawatha food pantries. So if you would like to make a monetary donation, just specify whether you want that to go to Sabetha or Hiawatha on, on your check, or if you use cash, just put that on the envelope. And of course, if you want to bring food items, we will deliver those then um, before Thanksgiving. And thank you for that. Women's Guild will meet this Wednesday for a pizza party. And it's also going to be Zoomed, so everybody can attend. And we'll have all that information. Um, will you send that out email, or how do you let people know how to? Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, as always, please share our YouTube worship services with anybody if they don't know about them. Um, all of our worship services all the way back to when we started doing this back in March, oh, they're still up there. So just let people know they're all on our Facebook page. Those are the only announcements I have. Now we've got a couple special young ladies celebrating birthdays this week. Jordan Hull has a birthday tomorrow. Laura Leertz has a birthday on Friday. And we also have a special anniversary. Elvin and Cleo have an anniversary tomorrow. So let's sing Happy Anniversary. Do you know Happy Anniversary, Kenya? Okay, what key would you think that would be a good one? Um, How about F? Sure. Key of F for Happy Anniversary. All right. I didn't know that was in your repertoire. That's good. I'm glad that's good. Well, if there are no further announcements, then let's open our worship service with prayer. King of love, we come to you as we are and not as we pretend to be. The truth is, God, when we lift our heads above the path, we too often discover ourselves lost in a maze of choices. And Lord, we confess from the very beginning of this worship time that we are lost in the maze. And if it were not for you, O oh Lord, we would be lost forever. But because of you, there is room for us at the great banquet. Lord Jesus, King of love, seek and find us as we are, not as we want to be or not as we pretend to be. Be patient with us and teach us how to wait. May your Holy Spirit fill us this hour. Let our worship be worthy of you. King of love, lead us. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. 
day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Worship the Lord in beautiful holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness. Our opening hymn is number 259. No, I'm sorry, it's not number 259. Wrong bulletin. Number 40, great is thy faithfulness. seated. Well, thank you, Kenya, for being here today. And uh, Kenya has written a beautiful arrangement of the piece Claire de Lune, Moonlight by Claude Debussy. And so I've asked her to uh, play that for us this morning. And she's written a wonderful piano part to it as well. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Here it is.
And we are working on a recording project. Of, it's going to be all, all of her arrangements, and we're writing some original stuff too. So look for that in the next three months, a couple years. <laughs> oh, I'm excited about today's gospel. Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. It's, in, it's on page 1408 in the Pew Bibles. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity. 
and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. So tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to, he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Now would you pray with me? Holy God, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase. Send your Holy Spirit to guide our words and our meditations. Lord, impress your word upon our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the perfect time of year. This is the perfect year. I can do these. Yeah, great. We're fin- yeah, we, we, can, we can handle it. We need a little more air moving through here, maybe. We can open doors and things. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for turning them off, though, because the, the music was going everywhere. Yeah. The reason I'm excited about this gospel is because this is so perfect for this time of year. Um, 2020. Did you all know this is an election year? Uh-huh. All right. And we have all these conversations about COVID-19. We've got conversations about how to fix the economy. We've got conversations about all these other topics that raise social and moral questions. And how the candidates answer these questions will make a difference in the election, in the polls, in what happens when the election happens, and also which political agendas move forward. And this is exactly the atmosphere of today's gospel reading. This is exactly the atmosphere in which the Pharisees and the Herodians ask Jesus this question. And all the readings that we've had for the past several weeks are leading up to this. They all take place between Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his crucifixion. So all of this is happening during Holy Week, between Palm Sunday and and Good Friday. And the stakes are very high for the religious leaders, for the political leaders. The stakes are high because they stood to lose power if the kingdom of heaven is advanced. Because what's going to happen? If the kingdom of heaven comes and the first shall be last and the last shall be first, then all of those who are high up on the political ladder and the religious ladder they stand to lose a lot of power if suddenly the kingdom of heaven breaks upon the earth. So we see two rival political and religious factions working together, the Pharisees and the Herodians. And they're cooperating in a common goal. And the common goal is they want to get rid of Jesus. Now, to point up how remarkable this was that the Pharisees and the Herodians would work together. Imagine this headline. Republicans and Democrats cooperate. We'll just stop there. <laughs> Republicans and Democrats cooperate. This is, this, <laughs> how would we get them to agree on anything? Well, we would need a disaster of such epic proportions that they would put aside all of their other differences and work together. That's what it would take, wouldn't it? Well, you'd have to have one common threat that you would focus upon. This is exactly what's going on here. Now today we might consider what? A natural disaster. A big natural disaster that affects the whole country would get Republicans and Democrats working. In today's gospel, the common threat is Jesus. 
It's incredible, isn't it? When we think about Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the Word of God made flesh, was considered to be such a threat to political and religious power that it would make Pharisees and Herodians worked together. These competing religious parties united their efforts and they agreed on one thing and one thing only. Jesus has got to go. And later on in the week, they would bring in the Sadducees, another rival party. And finally, by the end of the week, who do they bring in? The government. The Roman government. All of them working together on this common goal to get rid of Jesus Christ. Now the Pharisees and Herodians, their question is a clever one. And I'm sure they thought long and hard about how they were going to word this question because it's actually, from a human point of view, brilliantly constructed. Okay? And I'll bet they congratulated each other on coming up with a question that was going to do the trick. And first what they try to do, they try to butter Jesus up. They try to flatter Jesus. And that's why I used my slimy reading voice when I was reading the the Pharisees' words. You you, you, You are a man of integrity. And then they ask the question, tell us, Jesus, what is your opinion? Is it legal to pay the imperial tax or not? Now, the imperial tax to Caesar was one denarius. And this is a denarius in your bulletin. I've got a picture of it in there for you, front and back. That is a Roman denarius from Jesus' day. And this was not like our income tax, and it was not like our property tax. The census tax, as it was called, this is money that the Israelites were required to pay the Roman government to stay alive. This was protection money. This was money that you paid the government in exchange for them not killing you. It was part of a thoroughly corrupt system. We won't kill you if you pay us this money, maybe. And the Israelites hated it because every time they paid this tax, it reminded them that they were not a free nation. They were a province of Rome. In fact, they were more like a reservation within the massive Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, as we know, was a pagan empire, right? Many gods, many immoral practices. So the question of the imperial tax, you know, we've got our big political questions in 2020. This was the big political question 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day. Imperial tax, is it legal to require this or not? And this is why the Pharisees and Herodians' question to Jesus was such a good question. Because if Jesus replied, yes, it is legal to pay this census tax, then all of Jesus' followers would see Jesus as a traitor to the nation of Israel. They would say, he's sold out. Jesus has sold out to the government. We can't trust him. He has betrayed the Israelite people. And if he says, no, it is not legal to pay the census tax, then the Roman government will see him as a revolutionary, as a rebel. And we know what the Romans did to rebels. So either he's going to be discredited or he's going to be executed. Either way, the Pharisees and Herodians think, we've got him either way. We've got got the problem solved. But Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the Word of God made flesh. You can't trap Jesus with words because He is the Word. And so He answers the question behind their question. He says, give me the coin that you use to pay the tax. Let me see one. So they hand Him one of these silver denarius. Or denarii, I guess would be plural. And this loses a little bit of impact on us as Americans because our dollars work wherever you go in America. If you go to Colorado, if you go to Missouri, you go to Oklahoma, Nebraska, you can pay with dollars. In fact, even if you go down into Mexico, a lot of times you can still pay with dollars. We don't have to worry about changing the currency when we go to a different state or a different town. But that's not the way it was in Jesus' day. In the Roman Empire, there were all kinds of currencies floating around. 
And the Israelites, as a province of Rome, were allowed to mint coins, but they had to be copper coins. Only the Roman government was allowed to mint silver and gold coins. And so the Israelites, they did not, they did not have any images on their coins. Because remember the Ten Commandments? Remember number one? I am the Lord your God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not create to thee a graven image. So this was a big problem. Because the Roman coins had faces on them. Israelite coins did not have faces on them. So in order to pay the Roman census tax, the Israelites had to buy a denarius with their Israelite money. They had to get a hold of one of these coins in order to pay the Roman government. And so this meant that, um, this is why Jesus says, whose image is this? And of course the answer is Caesar. And this is Caesar Tiberius. And if you've read your Roman history, you know this guy was crazy. He was a crazy man. But that's, for, that's another topic. The fact that Jesus asked them to identify the face on the coin is significant for several reasons. Again, the Israelites, when they minted their money, no faces, no images on their money because of the Ten Commandments, because of the commandment against idolatry. But the money from the Roman mint did have Caesar's face printed on it. In addition to it, it has some words, and this is what the words say. On the front it says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the god Augustus. And then on the backs it says, it says uh, Pontif Maxim, or Pontifex Maximus, divine high priest. Now, as followers of Jesus Christ, if I were to say to you the phrase, Son of God, Holy High Priest, who would you think of? You'd think of Jesus, yes. The Roman coin says this guy is the Son of God, Holy High Priest. That's a big problem if you are faithful to the one true God. Now we talked about how the Israelites hated being Roman subjects. They weren't a free nation. They were more like a reservation within the massive pagan Roman Empire. So the Israelites are now in possession of these coins that have not only a graven image on the front, but it also claims that this guy is the son of God and is the holy high priest. So every time the Jews paid the imperial tax with one of these coins, it was like they were agreeing with what was on the coin. They were giving their assent to this claim that this guy, Tiberius Caesar, is the Son of God and is the holy high priest. And that's bad. But you know what? This coin is also worth a lot more money than the Israelite coins. A lot more than those copper coins. And so a lot of the Israelites would make exceptions to this. They would say, well, yes, idolatry is bad. And we are totally against idolatry. But these idols are worth a lot of money. So it's okay. We can have our money. But we can still love God. As long as we have money, we can still love God, and even though it looks like we're worshiping idols, we're not. That was the logic. It looks like we're worshiping idols, but we're not, because they're worth money. Do people ever compromise their faith for the sake of comfort, for the sake of convenience, for the sake of political power? for the sake of money. It's exactly what was going on right here. See, this is, this is more than the Israelites paying an annual membership fee to the Roman government. What we have here is a gradual giving up of God's values in favor of the values of society. The Israelites, we are totally opposed to worshiping idols unless the idols happen to be in the form of money. 
So when the Pharisees and Herodians answer Jesus' question, and they say, okay, this is the image of Caesar, correctly identifying the emperor's face, Jesus delivers an amazing answer. He says, well then, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar's, and give to God what belongs to God. And the key to Jesus' answer is in the balance of these two statements. First part, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay, it could mean he's just saying, yeah, pay your taxes. Pay the census tax. But the second part raises a question. He says, well, and give to God what belongs to God. And the question this raises is, what doesn't belong to God? What doesn't belong to God? The answer to this question is Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. We all belong to God. It all belongs to God. Everything that we have is derived, has its existence, because God has given it to us. It all belongs to God. The beauty of Jesus' answer is, yeah, He concedes the payment of the census tax, but in so doing, he also subverts the power of Caesar. In other words, worldly power. If we read Jesus' words one way, we could say, okay, what Jesus is saying is that Christians should submit to the government. Yet, when we read the second part of Jesus' answer, Jesus is saying, give to God what is God's, and it's all God's. It all belongs to God. Everything we have, everything we are, is ultimately provided to us from one source, and that is God. And in answering this way, Jesus makes absolute nonsense of Roman imperial power, and indeed any power in the world that claims to have absolute power. This idolatrous claim of Caesar Tiberius that he is the Son of God, that he is the divine chosen one, the divine high priest, With Jesus' answer, He reasserts God's power and He moves forward the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that funny that the Pharisees and the Herodians in their desire to silence Jesus and to trap Him and put Him out of the way, what they did, they actually opened the gates of the kingdom of heaven just a little bit more. And Jesus' answer serves as a call to repentance. For his listeners, all the Israelites who were listening to how he would answer this question, he said, okay, tell us, look in your heart and see where do your true loyalties lie? If Jesus' listeners should return to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, well, why stop at this one silver denarius? What about all those other things in their house? All that gold that has Caesar's face imprinted on it too. He says, why don't you give that back to Caesar as well? If you're not willing, why? Is it because maybe Caesar's face is imprinted on your heart instead of the face of God? And I had to ask, "All right, whose face is impressed on my heart? Is it God? Or is it an image that the world tells me should be impressed on my heart? See, the Pharisees and the Herodians unwittingly advanced the cause of Jesus Christ. They advanced the kingdom of heaven. That's always the way it is. See, God can make all things work together for good, even those things that are designed to trip up Jesus Christ. God turned that around and used it as a way of opening the gates of the kingdom of heaven. And everybody went away amazed, the Bible tells us. So, at the core, the issues raised in today's Gospel are ones of faithfulness and loyalty. Because if everything belongs to God, that means you and I belong to God. You and I are God's people, God's creations, God's creatures, the sheep of His pasture. If everything belongs to God, we belong to God, and yet we live in a world where The culture, the power, the politics try to own us and try to change us. 
try to get us to compromise our faith, to compromise our values and our loyalty, and in so doing, gradually capture our hearts, gradually impress the image of the world upon our hearts. Just like the Israelites were using Roman coins to pay the imperial Roman tax. And the Romans were smart. They used God language. They used the language of faith. People are still doing that. Using God language. Language that sounds almost like it could be biblical. Almost sounds like Scripture. To make the ambitions of the world more palatable to people of faith. And that gradually assimilates people of faith into a world of pagan idolatry and greed and so that we finally give our consent to it. Jesus' answer to His questioners is also Jesus' call to us to live in wholehearted faithfulness and loyalty to God while we are still navigating in this world. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And this world pulls, always pulls, at our faithfulness and at our loyalty. Jesus assigns us to the world as missionaries. The kingdom of God is within us. We are missionaries. We are assigned to the world, but the world wants to, the, 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 the enemy wants to assign the world to us. Okay? Jesus assigns us to the world. The enemy wants to assign the world to us. And so, as always, it is our joyful task to let the kingdom of God shine within us so that other people can see that light and find their way to Jesus Christ for themselves and have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Let that light shine so that people can see whose image is impressed upon our hearts. That it is indeed the image of Jesus Christ. And that they can come to know Him and follow Him and ultimately give glory to God. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is right along those Lines, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Number 34. Lutheran church where there's 20 verses for every coming. All right. Thank you. Please be seated.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We thank you all for your faithful gifts to the church that have allowed us to continue in these extraordinary times to proclaim the gospel. So let's sing the doxology and dedicate this offering to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him heavenly hosts, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh. <laughs> what setting was that? <laughs> it sounded like a herd of cats. <laughs> well, we won't use, that's very good. All right, well, let's dedicate this offering to God. Lord, you have given us time and the season. You have given us families and friends. You have given us our family of the church. Creator God, Lord of the universe, accept our gifts and our lives, that the world and all people may praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is number 13, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. Our closing prayer is an adaptation of Psalm 115, 
and it's a kind of call and response prayer. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. O God, when we stray from you and disobey your commandments, when we have trusted our own judgment, we wonder why we feel distant from you. We have worshipped idols of silver and gold, really idols of self and comfort. These have no power. These have no soul. These have no life. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Forgive us, gracious God, and help us to love as we ought, obey you as we were taught, and trust that our forgiveness has been bought. In Jesus' name, amen. And Kenya has uh, transcribed a, a variation of praise to the Lord the Almighty, so that'll be our postlude today. 